<laughs> <Not now. laughs> so, as uh, Rolf very kindly said, the idea uh, with this panel is to make sure, just in case standards have somehow slipped between the cracks, either in the presentations or the, the World Cafe, we're going to make sure it doesn't fall between the cracks by uh, asking our four noble panelists to uh, wrap their minds around some of the associated issues. So if I may, now I know they've been here for two days, I think you've all been here for two days, so you all ought to know one another, and yet. So what I'm going to ask the panelists to do, starting with you, if I may, Marilyn, absolutely introduce yourself and absolutely say where you come from. But what about just telling us really briefly why you came and, and how's it worked? How about well, that? Okay. And then uh, we'll ask, we'll go like this in a sort of Mexican wave. Okay, very quickly. My name is Mary Lynn Nielsen and I'm the Global Outreach and Operations Program Director for the IEEE Standards Association. Why am I here at this event? I'm here because the global intersection of the industrial needs of IoT, the consumer needs of IoT, the legislative needs of IoT, and the societal needs of IoT are ever growing, ever mingling, and ever more confusing. So anything we can do to shed a little more light on that, I believe is worthwhile. Splendid, what a good example to set. Namaste. Uh, Wolfgang. My name is Wolfgang Dorst. I'm head of uh, Department Industry 4.0 in the Industry Association for the ICT and Communication and New Media Industry in Germany. And um, I'm here to share minds with you about the fact that digitalization and networking cannot be stopped. It's a technology that will happen if we like this or not, and therefore it's necessary that we shape it and the conference can be one place to do that. Another excellent example of brevity and clarity. Thomas, beat those two. <laughs> I will do my best. Okay, thank you. My name is Thomas Hahn from Siemens Corporate Technology, involved in different activities. Alliance of Internet of Things, like you just explained, uh, we are a member, let's say, Platform Industry 4.0, of course, it's somehow also our origin, maybe one or the other, has heard in the morning from uh, Horst Kaiser's presentation how we're going from the electrification automation to the digital transformation with the connectivity, the Internet of Things, the analytics, the data handling, and so on. So, and I'm somehow as corporate technology, let's say in the middle of this, because I'm a so called chief expert software to bring the uh, different topics, association, standardization bodies somehow together for the company, for the corporate technology. Why I'm here? Because, you know, uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, like I mentioned, is a really huge impact which we expect uh, for our business, like uh, Rost mentioned in the morning, with the digital transformation, and that's the reason why I'm here. And of course, the exchange of opinions, the exchange with the people here about standardization, standardization possibilities, that's the reason why I'm here. Who has the sense that Thomas is not a lazy man? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dave. So, my name's Dave Raggett. I have been involved in web standards since the beginning, well, 92 at least. And uh, so, I'm a member of staff, W3C, and we develop web technology standards. So, I'm here because I'm the, the lead, the technology lead for uh, this work on the web of things. We want to take the, uh, the web, the web of pages, and expand it into a web of things and help to realize the full potential for the IoT. And I'm here to listen to you guys. Oh, I like that. That's the way to carry favor with the audience. Well, look, let's start with questions. Also, let's make sure we involve the audience. So just bear in mind, this is your conference, not ours. So we still have our stand microphones, right? So towards the end of this panel, I'm really going to urge you to take your position at those stands and, and have at this panel. So if, let's make the grammar quite simple. If you go near the stand, we'll know you want to say something. So please feel free to do that towards the end or actually at any time because that's what they're here for. So let's try and get this going then by saying, let me, let me choose you randomly, Mary Lynn. Why, you, you know, <laughs> all these various varied stands relevant to all sorts of different, how, how are we going to integrate that for, for IoT solutions. I mean, is this an impossibility or, or do you see hope? I actually do see hope, Jeremy. I think, I don't think integrating standards to find business solutions is anything new. 
Okay. I think companies have actually been doing this for many, many years. I think that we create profiles for different application needs, and then everyone is picking and choosing from the standards what they need to achieve that particular business goal. So the Internet of Things is not what we should be looking at. We're looking at the best possible thing for the, the best solution and the best standards. And the Internet of Things is a parameter that we're working within. And I think that in that sense of it, what it creates and the challenge that it can, can cause for us is this issue of convergence. We're dealing with technologies that don't normally relate to one another, or at least haven't in the past. And we're asking these people to speak a similar language. Uh, I was in the room when we first started doing standards for smart grid. Well, this was putting the ICT folks together with the power folks. And here are the ICT folks talking about their rate of technology change. And they're saying new iterations every six months, that's pretty good. The power folks are going, 10 years. And they have to talk to one another. Because now all of a sudden when you're adding smart to any technology, you're having to bridge a language gap. You're having to bridge a technology gap. You're having to bridge business expectations. Because when your cycles go from months to years to decades, you're speaking completely different languages. And so that, I think, is the thing that the IoT has truly highlighted, is that we have this need to think of our technology in completely different ways and to find that balance. One of the ways to find balance is to start looking at standards, to start saying what's been established in the past and what do we need to change in the future. Thomas, has she nailed it there, Mary Lynn? Yeah, I think, um, let's comment on this. When you're speaking about a standard in domains or vertical sure. standards, when you're speaking about standards in our domains, functional safety, for example, or uh, in the building technology, uh, when you're speaking about BACnet, when you're speaking about com uh, communication topics. But with the IoT topics, you're right, these things are coming together. The building has somehow relation to a smart grid outside of the building. Maybe connect connect uh, connectivity to some cars. So I have to speak to each other. So I think really with the standards in, let's say, in the domain, a vertical, we are, think, let's say, well established. I think you mentioned this, Wolfgang, also in your uh, keynote speech. but. The, you know, the borders may be the wrong word, but uh, the link to the different standards, how we're bringing this together, how we, we, we combine this in the Internet of Things world, where we have the facts that the topics are somehow, the things are somehow speaking to each other, uh, would be crucial. And that's, for example, um, we as a company are also, which may be not typical in the P2413, uh, present because exactly to have these different topics, to bring these different topic standards together in the Internet of Things perspective, I think is necessary. Wolfgang was scribbling fiercely, so there's something he either agrees with strongly or, or totally disagrees with. Mm. It depends. Um, it's common sense that uh, standards will help innovation, will help, um, how can I say, business security or investment uh, protection. Those things are common sense and therefore uh, the discussion about standards is uh, pretty common, and uh, if you step into a conference like this or a meeting room where people sit together in regard to Internet of Things or Industry 4.0, they will probably discuss the issue of standards. But nevertheless, we have to have in mind that standardization is something that needs its time. And, um, you know, I. Uh, we, we always talk about technical time standards. Time as in length of time. time yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, with elapsed time. So we, we talk about technical standards for networking, for example, but um, we have to have in mind that there are a lot of standards for the technical level already. So for example, what we just heard, there are a, a couple of, and we just f have to find out which one fits together. There is another area, this is semantics, and this is, um, already uh, covered by some uh, um, institutions um, and there is a lot of work from the past but for example I believe we cannot continue as we did in the past in terms of semantics so we cannot f uh, build segments verticals and then build a semantic in that vertical 
and then we cannot expect that we, for example, for Industry 4.0, we will have broadened this vertical over all um, segments in the value chain. It will, that will not work because we need a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time to do this. So I think we are on the point where we have to think in different ways about that. So to use, for example, computer learning uh, as we do this for translations to bring pragmatism to the semantics and the syntax of the um, communication. And how can I say? Uh, we should not wait that we um, complete these standards uh, because one first rule of manufacturing is the one who starts will finish. And if we not start, we will not finish with that the is things. But isn't that always true? I mean, isn't that always the case within standards that, you know, we are looking at the magic moment when mm -hmm. the standard is there, mm -hmm. okay? And if you look at that, it's very rare to find. The reality is that every company is going to march its technology forward and try to claim standards domination by marketplace. That's, that's a business oper operation and it's perfectly logical and very sensible. But at the same time, the standards themselves evolve. When I look at IEEE standards, we're looking at taking a number of existing standards and morphing that. And I know that the W3C is doing the same thing. <laughs> You've just stolen my thunder because I'm going to say Dave with his W3C cat. Right. Surely. Yeah. Well, okay, so I was going to say, actually, I think standards, you shouldn't do a top-down, big, glorious standard because you'll never get there. In fact, right. as you can probably tell by my appearance, I'm a believe in scruffy approach to standards. <laughs> a scruffy, but you know, fast it's approach. The height of elegance. So right? the, the, I think it's very important that we should you know, do things incrementally evolutionary, and, uh, you know, rather, and rather than trying to bite off more than we can chew. And the second point, I think, was going back to the, the semantic stuff. I think we see there's a lot of standards already, a, you know, we're hearing, but there's also a lot of uh, isolation and fragmentation and, and then part, that's because uh, the things aren't, you know, there's no e easy way to couple them up together. It's very expensive and risky to build systems right now. So perhaps we ought to be looking for tools and techniques for being able to link across these platforms. And I think that's where semantics and rich metadata is really called for and where we can make a low. And I must obviously just put a little push. W3C has a big track record in work in this area, and I'm hoping that we can share that with you guys. <laughs> there you are. And that's I allowed. Think, I think an interesting aspect of this, when people ask me what the IoT is, you know what I tell them it is? You ever seen that story of nine blind men and the elephant? <laughs> that's the IoT. It's the elephant. The IoT is whatever part you're holding. So based on what technology you come from, what business you come from, your perception of the IoT is entirely colored by that. And that's the challenge that we're facing in standardization. Are you holding the tail of the elephant? Well, the IoT is long and skinny. Oh, no, I'm holding the body. The IoT is fat. Wolfgang had a lovely take on, on, on Industry 4.0 that, that, that you find yourself in the term. I thought that was a lovely. Yes. You get these inflection points where it's not quite, you know, crystallized. So you, you find and, yourself and in the Dave's term. And Dave's on something. There are parts and gaps that we can fill. IEEE's 2413 is looking at that architectural framework for the Internet of Things. This is a project driven by industry that's coming out. You know, its draft is, is coming to be available this fall. That's another trigger point for us to examine. No one standard will do it. It will be a compilation. Mm. As the IoT is vast, so will the standards. Thomas, do you yeah. think it would be fair to characterize the current approach as, as verticalized? And if so, is that, is that something that is feasible? Or, or, or is it just that it's natural that that's the first thing we sort out and then we try and do the... Yeah, let's say what I try to explain is also with the vertical and let's say horizontal yeah. standards is also yeah. some difficulties uh, right. because they are somehow uh, linked to each other and uh, uh, that we have to, to, to focus uh, on the auto face on this and of course you know mm. step by step as going forward. So I also have some problems, you know, uh, in, standard, in, in vertical standards we are well established uh, yeah. in 
total in the standard uh, bodies in, in vertical and uh, in horizontal and let's say it's a link to each other. Uh, let's say we have uh, room for improvement. I'll give you one example on the platform industry 4.0, which we have done. We have defined some kind of referent architecture mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. where we have uh, the hierarchy in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the plant. We have the value stream and we have the life cycle of uh, product and production. So and what we have done, we've just put it here, uh, the related standards uh, to it and given some kind of, of framework. Maybe this is also for the IoT stuff. Uh, and I think, uh, like you mentioned before, in the um, uh, Alliance of Internet uh, IoT initiatives, has one of the first tasks to bring this together because this bring on, brings up some framework uh, how we can yeah, step by step, I agree with you, if, if, when you're taking mm -hmm. a lot of time, it, it needs a lot of time, um, but when you make it step by step in a framework, it would be helpful also for the IoT stuff. It was interesting to see your, your survey, you know, exactly. show of hands, how many of, of you guys think it's important, a whole lot, how many are helping, not so many. So you, you have a duty of care here, it, it is apparently up to, to those who really have a chance to impact it, to just get on with it, which scares me a little, unscare me, Dave. Where does, o where does open source reassure me that, that that dichotomy won't be upsetting anything because there are, you know, mm. like you say, it's demotic. There are yeah. people at the base right. taking care of all of this. So I, I think we have to reach out to these different groups. So open source can play a role in helping you to sort of share knowledge and reduce the risk, increase reliability, reduce time to market, reduce costs. But that's got to be supported. So um, as we heard, the, the, some of the EU projects is all about researchers yep. and a short yep, time yep. scale. But we really need longer time scale support for uh, open source projects that the community is to be viable. For example, like the Apache Foundation has been going for many years and been very successful in providing the strong, yep. robust servers. I think we also need to couple this into work in, uh, in the kind of innovation. You know, how do we uh, help people who are doing startups uh, uh, and how do we help them? First of all, f obviously for the open source, but also through uh, uh, listening to them, what use cases, what challenges they have, what successes they have, and feeding up back into standards work. So I, I think this combination of the open source, the kind of maker communities, the entrepreneurs, the startups, feeding in, in, uh, into the standards, but also coming back to the larger companies. The larger companies, the medium-sized companies, are the ones who have the resources to actually get involved and do the standards work. It's not the standards organizations that do the work, it's the actual companies coming together right. in the fora that the standards organizations provide. Right. It's a win-win. Yeah. If, if they mm -hmm. sort it out, we all win. Tell them. I mean, maybe one comment to the, to the open source, also from the perspective of a, a large company, and you mentioned this, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, we are uh, as a company, or I'm as a person also involved in the OPC Foundation, where we have a standard uh, where we connect uh, the embedded world with the enterprise world. I see Chris here in the room where we have the connection to some kind of cloud uh, stuff. And this topic, uh, this development we, we propagate is, is, is open source mm -hmm. because we want to, to make it available for, for, let's say, for everybody. And of course, to get uh, some penetration uh, onto the market, which is maybe an, an, an example how we, we are handling this. Okay, I'm now going to work. Let, let me yes, add something. Uh, open source is not only a business model or a way to um, um, provide the, the knowledge. It's also a structural um, methodic approach to bring people together, to bring the best minds or bring the best ideas together in a community. Hmm. And this is an effect we, we should have to have in mind because in Europe, we really need the best people, the best ideas, and we need a platform that they share their minds, they share their ideas. And the open source community idea is probably one of those platforms to use for, for the, to, to make this happen. And therefore, we should always have in mind that open source is, is not only this uh, dirty child, uh, where some look uh, uh, in, a, in a way in distant too. So it is something we really need to get innovation in Europe. Right. Let me just personalize this a little. Mm -hmm. This is a little left of field, but let's see how it, how it will work. Mary Lynn, they do say, don't they, that if you can't explain it to your children, you don't understand it. Yes, we agree with that <laughs> premise. So. Standards is a very arcane area. 
of human activity. So let me pretend to be the child here, which I find very easy because my bandwidth is limited and my brain very small. Give me an example in the internet of things, space, where you feel or you know or it is said that, you know, if only we had these standards, such and such would be possible. Is there any, you know, not the low-hanging fruit, but obviously it's the higher-hanging fruit that you go, oh, I wish, I wish, in your actual life or in something you know about. You should all think on this, by the way. Okay. okay. There are certainly a number of them, and I, I'd spin this a couple of ways. Oh, what there a are. <laughs> The, the answer is that you need standards. The, what do standards bring? To, to go back to your childlike yeah, example, yeah. they bring interoperability and they bring portability. They allow things to work together and they allow you to take those things and have them work in different environments. That's the, the easy description I would give you of what the value is that they bring. So the interoperability is what you're aiming for. And so when you produce that with a standard, you're gaining that through the consensus process. And let me remind you of a very important thing that I always say about consensus. It means that nobody's 100% happy, that yeah. most of the people are happy most of the time. And so if you're only a little bit annoyed at the standard, that means it's a pretty okay. darn good standard because that's important to recognize with consensus. It's not unanimity. It means that balance. And so you're striving for that. You're going to be striving for it in two ways that I can think of. You do need new standards, and you do need new work in areas. One of the ones that we just started up, we have a couple that are rather interesting to me. We've got new standards on e-waste, electronic waste, how to handle, how to process. As we're moving that along, how does that fit into your Internet of Things? We've got new works on a 3D printing architecture. Okay? Yeah, 3D yeah, yeah. printing is a huge impact in this field and a completely unknown business yeah, impact. Yeah. As we start framing that architecture, that's where I believe industry wants to come in and say, what do we need this to be to move the industry forward? And that's where you come in and make your voice known because as Dave rightly pointed out, it's the openness of the process, the open aspect that the W3C definitely has as one of our partners in OpenStand and as that IEEE has to allow anyone into these communities. We don't restrict you. You come in, you make your voice heard. You can be the biggest company or the smallest. Your voice counts. The second aspect that I think is extremely important is old standards aren't going away. There are an incredible number of valuable standards that with a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of shifting, are going to become great IoT standards. The W3C has them. Dave's probably already working now on what he needs to shift and look at that smile, the existing standards to make them work for IoT. IEEE is the same thing. Everything relies on the 802 wireless, wireless communications ar architecture, wired communications architecture. 802.24 is all about IoT and there's another group dealing with the security privacy aspects of this now. So just because something is there doesn't mean it won't evolve to suit the IoT. So it's not necessarily new to fill the gaps. Right, right. It's also, let's upgrade the existing. As a child, I'm reassured. Wolfgang. Um, yeah. Let's say. That's optimistic, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's say I'm talking to Mary or to Dave or to Thomas or to you, Jeremy. And um, although we are from different uh, sectors from the industry or in uh, different business roles, we understand each other in that discussion. Hmm? So and the, the reason why is that we, each of us, we have a pragmatism that we can interpret what is meant in that context. But if you talk from one machine to another machine, then one machine and another machine don't have that context. They, they, they don't go, have good. that pragmatism. And therefore, we need a way to communicate between machines in a standard way. Otherwise, machine will say, stop. I don't understand what that machine is telling. Very and good, if I good. tell you the things, then yeah, you will say yes, yes, yes. Because even if you are not agree on this, or I use maybe different uh, vocabulary, or even different uh, semantics, you have the pragmatism as a human to interpret this. And in a world where we communicate between machines, we don't have that. And therefore, we need something to communicate. 
Thomas, any thoughts? Yes, I have um, maybe <laughs> have, uh, have, um, um, a views, let's say, a similar picture like you mm -hmm. described uh, somehow when machines, robots, maybe in the past are speaking different languages. Today, maybe they're speaking the same languages, but uh, the important thing is really to, to speak the behavior, what is it, what's the content, what are they doing, uh, what, what is possible with the machine to, to speak. You look, uh, I have to go in, 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 in maintenance. Can you take over this? Of course, as a human being, we can it directly. But to do this also on a, on, a, on a level that the machines can interact, like you mentioned, is, uh, let's say, where we have really to do something in the area. I'm feeling terribly calmed by all of this, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested <laughs> to see if the audience is equally calm. Is there anyone out there? Remember where those stand microphones are? Is there anyone there who finds that this is, is reassuring them to the extent that they, they, they had some fears that have now been completely swept away? Or is there anyone who has some experience that, you know, Stan is the only thing that, that, that Mary didn't answer to her child is, well, if it's that so simple, why does it take so long? There's but, one over there. Yeah. Please, can, can you bear to just go <laughs> to that <laughs> microphone? That's the spirit. And then you'll see that the, the floodgates will open. <laughs> it's always thus. So, yes. I, I would like to challenge a little bit uh, the picture which Wolfgang, you just presented, that machines, are to ma to machines to machines are communicating, they need to understand each other, need the same language. But if we consider IoT or even beyond uh, the industry of things, we have to deal with different types of mm -hmm. partners. So we have machine to machine communication, we have digital services. And as um, Thomas already pointed out, we have some kind of reference architecture where we really need to locate different standardizations. So the real challenge, I think, is not standardization itself, but the translation between different standards and the point how to, to really translate those with the right semantics and the right syntax. And I think your discussion should focus a little bit more about how we really get the standards interact with each other. So mm -hmm. what, need we be, what is, has to be done <laughs> that, that we really are able to combine all, all what we already have to find a solution and ensure the interaction. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is why we, this is why we call it an expert panel, because we <laughs> bring the experts. <laughs> so, 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 so my point is, I am not looking for a lot more new standards. We may adjust a few of them, OPC was one where we have already some ideas what needs to be done to get this, this, this readiness to mm -hmm. be able to translate, but what is the, the, the you might or you're thinking I'm about keen to answer. the translation? <laughs> They're all keen to answer. <laughs> Dave, you can answer. get first bite. Thank so, you. So I think it's a very good point. We need, we, we, existing standards, protocols, data formats are going to be around for a long while, and we have to make them interoperate. So you have to have information about what each device or each server supports. So we need metadata uh, def, you know, standards for that. And then we can build a soft, smart software which can figure out you know, how to do that in practice. And that's something I've been playing around actually in open source. So I, I think we need different kinds of metadata and we need some agreements across this and we need to work across the standards organizations to make it a reality. Wolfgang? Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> if I dial your phone number, Jeremy, then um, there is a standard in place that your phone rings. And then you lift, not yet. Thank God. <laughs> and then you lift the, 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 um, uh, the phone and um, we can talk to each other because we use, for example, English as a language. Mm -hmm. So this, this is, in a way, a standardiz standardized system because uh, to dial the number, that uh, the ringtone comes, and then uh, that we use uh, the same language. And um, with English, it is possible to call in Russia, to call in China, to call in false Korea. Um, almost every place and almost every person you can uh, reach with that language. And uh, I believe that in the IoT area and also in, in the Internet of Things or the, the, the in, uh, Indust Industry 4.0 area, it will not be possible to find one big language that represents all the processes or all the objects we have to deal with. 
We started with that 15 years ago, and we in Germany spent a huge of money with uh, one big, very big, big project uh, on semantics. But we cannot continue in that way to broaden that to all areas of business life. So what we need is something that we call an interpreter or a translator. And we see this in the web, you know, there is a Yandex translator or there is Google translator and you can toggle in if you uh, are in Moscow or if you are in New York and then you toggle in and then press translate and then the person vis-a-vis -vis you can read. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah. <laughs> and then come the, the pragmatic side. So what we need is a kind of a translation service. And I think we have technology with uh, machine learning technology, for example, to interpret between the different sectors of the industry or between different areas from smart home to smart logistic to smart energy and so forth. So there is a way, but I believe it's not the way that we sit down 100,000 people and define a standard to do. So we need smarter ways to do this. So we need a smart standard and a smart way to implement it for the smart technologies and the smart business areas. Smart standards for smart technologies. I like that idea, Thomas. Well, one, one comment maybe to you. We were speaking about that you in English can speak in, of course, UK, US. China, have you ever been in Beijing, uh, taking the taxi and speaking with him in, in English? No, Coming I back to the, bring you back to the hotel? No, I asked. <laughs> you have a little yeah. card no, yeah, normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was giving it as an example. <laughs> Mary Lee. I think the question, and, and I'm sort of going to build on what Wolfgang was saying, which is we often try to boil the ocean. I mean, as technologists, and uh, in particular when you look at engineers, it's, but we're supposed to solve the problem, aren't we? And that's a huge challenge, and I think one of the things that I know from working in standardization is when people come in with a new idea, they state it in the most lofty and broadest of terms. They really do. And then it gets back to your question of length, Jeremy, and then they actually start grinding into the work. And it keeps going, and it keeps going. And one of the things I've learned is you have to push people to just slice it and slice it and slice it. What can you achieve? Push that out. What can you achieve? Push that out. And get those standards going. And then sometimes they may not boil the ocean for you, but when you put them together, the ocean's gonna get pretty warm. And that's the advantage and the path I think we need is not to think that there is a solution but that as we build these solutions, we build them in a way that they are better integrated. And through this philosophy of sharing between organizations, which we now try more and more to do, we'll better build that to serve the industry and then to serve the people that industry is there for. And I think that's the major point, is, is we tend to state it in this very, very broad sense, which makes a perfectly logical reason to do something, but it's often too much and can often be too discouraging. Let's experiment with Dave's open source approach, his down up approach. Dave, here is a, 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 not a random audience, right? Because they're an industry of things, well, 2015. So what can the audience collectively or individually or a combination of both, what can they do from next week when they get back to their offices, what can they do in all of this? What should they do? Well, uh, I think they can certainly help us look at the use cases and requirements and see what other work has been done and have a take a look at the open source work that's out there. I wanted to get back to what you were saying about kids earlier. Uh -huh. but I, th I think that uh, uh, not only do we want to be able to explain it to our children, but we want our children to be able to try it out for themselves because <laughs> like they'll yeah. be the next generation of employees. So I, I think I really like the work that's been done with the Arduino. Yep, yep, simplifying yep. C++ to the point you don't have to know anything about C++. Yep. So <laughs> can, we, can we create simple things for people to learn and explore and build the concepts? And I, I think, like what you're saying, uh, that the um, 
engineers like to solve problems by splitting them up into small pieces, but we need that to talk to each other to identify what are the pieces that are the low-hanging fruit. You know, which are the incremental pieces we should be doing rather than trying to do in the wrong Does order? Does that resonate with the audience, what Dave is saying? Is there anybody whose children have, have, have been involved in Arduino or Makers or anything like that? Yeah, you see, the, the, what, the, you can lift it more <laughs> firmly. <laughs> yes, exactly. But not so many, and over here as well. So I think still room for improvement. Challenge yourself consistently. I mean, because I was hearing Wolfgang's example. I'm going to pick on you for a minute. I hope you don't mind. But um, you, you're talking in terms of the phone, and we pick up the phone in this. But have you ever watched a small child with TV recently? They walk up and they touch the TV screen because that's what pads and phones do. You touch it, and it's ch why isn't this changing when I touch it? Well, it will. It will. They're, but they're hardwired to think that way. And one of the most difficult things that we have to confront ourselves with when looking at IoT is, yes, we do need to have backwards compatibility. We do need to retrofit. Not only technology, we need to retrofit our standards. We need to do that. But we also need to shake ourselves up. <laughs> and that there may be different paradigms that will offer us the best possibility for performance. Think of a two-year-old touching your TV. We don't think that way. I, I, think, think, uh, I think another useful thing to think about is the evolution. You know, there's some ideas which can refine you know, over time, become really, and play off other ideas, like a predator prey or whatever you might want to think. But then there are other ideas, they just got so complex after a while, you can no longer usefully extend them. And they just die off. So we shouldn't be afraid of a little competition. Yeah. I think a com you know, we can't predict the correct idea first time around. Mm -hmm. The best engineers in the room will not get it right first time. So we should allow for some degree of scruffiness, some degree of competition, and see what things work. Such and that's a natural yeah. result of the marketplace. Standards never replace competition. Yeah. You know, you can develop a standard and absolutely nobody uses it, it dies. All right, period. Standards reflect what industry chooses as its models, and quite bluntly, also what the consumers choose as their model. Right? We've all seen it. We all know the stories of how the best technologies in the world failed because they didn't identify, they could have been, they were actually better technologies, but ev all of us can cite cases of better technologies that died oh. and lesser technologies that succeeded. And that element is always going to be there. A standard is there to facilitate that, not to replace it. It is a tool for that and not a solution in and of itself. It drives that to happen. And that's why you want it to be as open as it can be, as broad as it can be, and as useful as it can be. But standards, just like technology, are unpredictable. And that's the thing to keep in mind. We are going to make that the final word because it's something to take home, the unpredictability of standards. Can we, in the time-honored fashion, thank our panel? And while we're thanking Mary Lynn Nielsen, come along, come along. We're going to thank them. <laughs> Wolfgang Dorf. Thomas Hahn and Dave Raggett, and, and thank you, audience, for, uh, for bearing with us, because we really do think this is in, an important element. I hope you don't feel we're knocking it down on your heads, but it is important. So thank you, gentlemen and lady, for making that as engaging as it is.